Good evening. Bonsoir. Hi everybody, welcome. Puny, puny. Welcome to Web Wednesday. We have the tallest guest we've ever had. So to uh, exaggerate the difference, he's going to sit on a really tall stool. <coughs> and we also have at the back, don't look now, TVB. TVB Pearl. So make sure they get your best angle. There, there are some mirrors here if you want to do your makeup. All looking good? Excellent. So, thank you all for coming. This is our 47th uh, Web Wednesday. Come closer. I, I had coffee with Gert earlier and he didn't spit on me once. So, come closer. Please come closer. We're really nice. The closer you get, the less likely TVB is to find your ball patch. <laughs> Nicola. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. So come closer. Be nice. Do come up to the front. Alright. I just want to say that tonight we have a very special guest, Gert Leonhardt. If you're on Twitter, his Twitter account is at G Leon L E O N Hard. Right? Fine. You tell them later. So if you want to ask him a question, you're really, really shy. Do you have access to your... And you're really, really shy. I'm going to come up and give you the microphone. Or you can do it on Twitter, but I prefer face-to-face. -face. All right? And we have some rather beautiful women. Thank you, Jennifer, for coming. So, so let me just say, tonight, uh, Gert is here because of... The people from Branded, Jasper here. Have any of you been to Music Matters? Yeah, three, four, five. Five of you, six of you. How many of those who put their hand up work for Branded? Three of you, two of you. So Music Matters has grown. He's done a great job. And this year they have two days of an event called Digital Matters, which Jasper is going to say a few words about. Thank you, Napoleon. Uh, hello, my name's Jasper. I uh, run a company called Branded. We own Music Matters, uh, which is in Singapore this year. Sorry if you're from the Hong Kong government. Um, and we have this wonderful event called Digital Matters as well, uh, two days before it. Plus, on top of that, this year we are hosting 40 bands from 18 countries, I think, in seven different venues. So, if you're in Singapore at the end of May, uh, we've got this kind of mini South by Southwest thing going down there, so uh, uh, we, it, we're pretty excited about that. That's why I look so tired at the moment. Um, we've been trying to work with Gerd for many years. I keep bumping into him at places like Midem and, and uh, cool, cool music conferences around the world. And Our schedules have never met for Music Matters, so when he told me he was going to be in Hong Kong at the beginning of May, we got very excited. When we worked out it was the first Wednesday in May, we got even more excited because it meant that we could... Uh, we could work with Napoleon. So uh, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. We're very happy to be co-presenting the tallest, tallest man in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and yeah, uh, Digital Matters, Music Matters. Oh, by the way, Digital Matters is presented in association with Casbar, who are also in the front row today. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in Singapore in May. Thank you very much. So, um, ooh. Special offer if you're at Web Wednesday or if you go to my blog. Forget the W's, there's something wrong with my server. Web Wednesday for Asia. Uh, they're offering, was it 20% off? Something like that. Something like that. 20% off, which is 300 US dollars off. And if you drop your card at the entrance, you will get, if you're lucky, the first prize a ticket to Digital Matters, which is on the 24th and 25th of May. Unfortunately, you're going to have to fly there by yourself. <laughs> Tickets are cheap. Yeah, everybody wants to go to Singapore. <laughs> Marina Bay. And Gert has got his own book here, signed by the tallest man in Web Wednesday. <laughs> Officially, the tallest man in Web Wednesday. 
So the second and third prize is a copy of his book. Now, what's interesting about this book he was telling us earlier is it is printed where? Yeah. In Indonesia. In Indonesia. So it's actually downloaded off the web and printed in Indonesia. <laughs> uh, any issues with your copyright on it? There is none. No, 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 no copyright. It's Excellent. Microphone. Microphone. So it's a free book, but he's going to give away a signed one, which is worth millions. And I have some Groupon things from the last uh, Groupon interview we did for an art jam, but it only lasts two more days. So if you want to go an art jam in the next two days, come up to me. I've got loads of Groupon coupons. Be nice. And then finally, our next Web Wednesday is on the June 1st, and we have CNN Go, the... Uh, Manager of CNN Go here, Bikram. Don, are you here? Don Anderson. Are you here? He's not here. June the 1st. All right, let's get into it. So we're going to do it slightly differently today. We're actually going to do a presentation. Now, I, I'm very against presentations in nightclubs. But Gert is tall and he scared me. So I gave in. But also, he's a very famous speaker. Um, how many of you read about him on my blog. There you go. So you know how famous he is. Seven. Yeah, that's not bad. 50 megabyte. He is described as... Is this what you call yourself? Well, Gert, how do you describe yourself? Later. He's a keynote speaker. He's a think tank leader. He's a futurist. He's an author. He's a strategist. He's an idea curator. Cool. Occasional heretic. What do you do that's heretic? Good question. Good question. Later. And he's a visiting professor in Brazil. I wonder why. <laughs> Can I be a visiting professor in Brazil? It's on? Yeah. Awesome. He's a futurist, but he doesn't know anything about the past, so he has no idea how to use a microphone. <laughs> so basically, he's going to talk to us about the future, the future of entertainment, and selling it. So I'm going to pass this over to you. So the way we're going to do this is Gert is going to keep us stimulated for the next 30 to 40 minutes, and we'll take questions from the floor. All right? And I know a few of you have already got some questions. So let's get into it. I'm going to move this across to your presentation. Great. Uh, okay. While you're moving this, I, I will, I'll take over here from you. Um, it's kind of strange here being on the stage and, and uh, hitting the lamp, uh, the light, lighting system here. <clears throat> anyway, I used to be a musician, so I'm quite familiar with this looking down position. Um, I live in Switzerland. But uh, I studied music in the, in the States. I lived there for 17 years. Um, I was an active musician, made 20 records, wrote a few books, as you can tell. Um, the slides are here, but they're also over there on this better-looking screen. So, so you're welcome to twist your head back and forth uh, or use some sort of rear vision you know, to, to get this done. But the slides aren't important anyway. Can we... Is it sound okay or is it... Sounds a little bit booming. Yeah, is it good? Okay. All right. All right. So, as I'm sitting in my own slide, so to speak, <laughs> you can only see a fraction of it, but it doesn't matter. So, basically, this is what I do. I, I work as a futurist. So, what that means is I, I look at trends the next two, three, five years. I run a company called the Futures Agency, and we try to help uh, companies reinvent, mostly the content business. So, films, television, music, broadcasting, software, apps, mobile telecoms, marketing, and so on. Here's my Twitter name, G. Leonhardt, and my company, the Futures Agency. If you want to tweet, my device is on. It's a very bad network in here, but I, I'll keep monitoring so you can slander me on Twitter uh, or say something mean or make weird photos. Okay, uh, I'm going to get right into it. So tonight I want to talk about the future of entertainment on the internet. Uh, of course, the, by far the most common question is, uh, how do we actually make money with, on the internet or on the mobile or on social networks? Uh, just yesterday, I ran across this really interesting uh, thing. I think this is from CNN, actually, where I hijacked it. 
Um, this is sort of our world, right? And you, you guys may be familiar. It's quite booming. Can we turn the sound a little bit less aggressively? Hello, anyone? Just carry on talking. We bought. Okay, it's a little bit, a little bit on the heavy side here. So, anyway, we'll keep talking. So. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, who is the original sort of futurist, you may know Marshall McLuhan from the 70s, said, 1971 he said, the global village is not peace, harmony and quiet, it's actually rather chaotic. And there's many conversations and things going on, and this is really sort of the global village that we live in today. Um, again, you can't really see it here, but China, and you can see it over there, yes. Uh, China is in a very interesting place. China has more internet users than the US. The speed is much slower, and the penetration, of course, is much slower as well. So where this is going, quite clearly, now the sound is really different. Is that good? Or? Sounds much better. Okay, good. Can right. you hear at the back? Cool. So this is from Pinkton. Now, clearly where this is going, like China in the next two or three years will probably double this number, triple the speed, and really increase the penetration. And then we're going to talk about the problems that we're having with downloading and people sharing content for free in Preventasys, right? We're only at the tip of the iceberg. Right? And this is all gonna be mobile, of course, mobile traffic. So all the concerns that we have today about monetizing content will, they look like little sand corns today, they will be very large in the future. Um, clearly, the future of content is not gonna be invented in America or in Europe is going to be invented in the developing countries. Right, because that's where all of the, the expansion, the growth is in the next few years. I just came back from Indonesia, where I work with companies there, uh, also the telecom company, to reinvent how people consume media, uh, what they pay, how they pay, how they have access to content, which I'll explain in a second. Right? So all of the interesting stuff is no longer going to come from, you know, over there in the corner. As, as far as that commerce is concerned, but from the developing countries. Um, so, again, it's hard to see here. I should have probably just saved the slides, but uh, mobile data in China is exploding. I mean, if you see the curve is like this, so a little bit of that you can see here, but basically mobile data means that all of a sudden people who never actually had a choice even on a computer, now they're on the mobile doing all kinds of things like watching videos and rating restaurants and ordering a ticket or buying, a, buying a, or doing banking online. It's exploding. The, the highest number of users on the mobile web are actually in Africa, right, which is very hard to imagine because they have slow connections. Right? But this is empowerment. Uh, I was just talking earlier, I'm speaking tomorrow at the uh, Consumers World Congress, which is here in, in Hong Kong right now. I'm speaking there tomorrow. So what we're seeing that is because of the mobile, is that users feel really empowered to actually do stuff. For example, in Germany, uh, if you go to a restaurant and you put your iPhone on the table, German waiters will realize that you have the iPhone, you can give them a bad review in that moment, right? and they'll serve you better. Right? Even if it's just fake, I tried it, believe me, it works. They realize all of a sudden we are empowered consumers because we have this box. It changes everything. So all of a sudden, restaurants start caring what people say about them, which they didn't use to in Germany, believe me, they did not. So all of a sudden, they, they say, okay, do you review the hotel on TripAdvisor? And you see the, sticks, the stickers coming up uh, in the hotel saying, please say something good on Facebook. Right? Now that's called empowerment, and empowerment is good for us as, as users, but for companies it can be hell, of course. As we've seen in the music industry, the empowerment of the user has resulted in 71% decline of sales. Right? Because basically the empowerment wasn't appreciated. We'll talk about that in a second, what the solution for that would be. So, is this working? It's working. Okay, so I, uh, this is an interesting slide because basically I think you know this. The consumer who just used to sort of sit there and do stuff, all of a sudden the consumer has turned out to be a lot of different people, right? A consumer, a producer, a participant, a multiplier, an influencer, and all these different kind of people do different things in media to change the landscape. For example, if you look at YouTube, right, the bottom line of YouTube, which was rather ridiculous when they launched, everybody thought, you know, this can't be. Broadcast yourself? Like, what kind of headline is that? I mean, who wants to listen to my broadcast? Right? Because, you know, I'm not 
uh, and not um, Paul Sappho or something like this, right? So broadcast yourself was a very provocative headline. Turns out that people are actually doing this. And YouTube beat MTV in 24 months in terms of popularity with a very simple just understanding that there's different kinds of people. So that's what we're seeing here in terms of content. Now, uh, Kevin Kelly, who's the founder of Wired Magazine, he says what's happening is that uh, we're all of a sudden becoming people of the screen. People of the screen means we're, we're no longer just people of the paper. You know, I'm, I'm old enough to be a, people, a person of the book or the paper, right? And uh, I hope it doesn't go away completely. But today, it's all about screens. Right? Screens everywhere. You have QR codes on buildings. You have DVDs in the backseat of the car. You have internet on the airplane. You have mobile devices. You have projections on your iris. You have, I mean, yeah. You know, just think of that, telepresence, uh, robotics, hol holography, right? it's all about screens. So people of the screen will not consume content in the same way than people of the book. And there's nothing we can do about it. We can't tell them to please go back to people of plastic, the CD. It's not going to happen. We can't tell them to say, please buy cable when you can watch you YouTube for free. Right? It's not going to happen. So people of the screen are entirely different kind of people. I don't think books will go away, or newspapers, positively. But of course they have to be also on the screen. I mean, you can see basically Cisco is projecting that 85% of the entire internet traffic will be video in five years. And 90% of that will be on mobile devices. Now think about what that means for advertising, for marketing, for reaching people, for artists that want to sell their stuff, right? I mean, people off the screen are a perfect target for these things. So, uh, Kevin Kelly talks more about this, but basically, what we're seeing in this landscape is that we have thousands of options of stuff that we can do, fragmentation. So there was a book a long time ago, it feels like a long time ago, five years ago, by Chris Anderson called The Long Tail. You may have read the book. I do some work with Chris, and basically on this whole debate of a long tail, everybody's always saying, well, you know, it's not really true, we live in a hit society. But see what happens today on a music service like Spotify, or Netflix, or on Amazon, all the little things are getting in the aggregate a huge amount of attention. 72% of YouTube traffic is from unknown stuff, or from people who happen to have something that somebody likes and, and forwards. So we have this complete... Uh, fragmentation. Uh, you can't see this down here is actually the most important part that because of this fragmentation what's needed more than ever before is curation. And if you're in the media business you're not going to actually sell distribution, you're not going to sell the cable network, you're not going to sell the fact that you're big, you're going to sell curation. Because basically when we have all these options the most important part is that we have the right choice. If you think back about five years ago you go to a party, 15-year-old kids or so teenagers, they are at the party with big hard drives. 100,000 songs downloaded for free. I did not pay. That was a big accomplishment. Today, when you go to a party, there's no hard drives. It's playlists on YouTube. And guess what the criteria for coolness is? Not how many songs you have, but which songs you, you bookmark. You know the coolest stuff, and therefore you're the coolest guy. It has nothing to do with distribution but with curation. So in the media business, we're all moving in this direction. Curation, filtering, relevance, context, not just noise. Right? I mean, Twitter is the best example. Twitter is to 99.8% noise. Right? And I don't mind it because I know how to curate. So you take an app like Flipboard. You guys know Flipboard on the iPad? Or Instapaper or Hootsuite or whatever. You can filter stuff. That is the important part. So, um, I think basically what we're seeing here in media is that the value is not going to be so much in just delivering stuff, but in selecting things that fits us uh, in the fragmentation. And that's also, of course, the future of newspapers. Now, this is the television of the future. This television is us. It's like us television. And guess who's the biggest television station in the world? Well, the two biggest. I should, I'm, I'm here, so I should use both examples, right? QZone, QQ, and Facebook are the biggest countries in the world. QZone has 680 million users, I think, QQ. 
and Facebook has 650 million users. They are the biggest broadcasters in the world. And guess what they're broadcasting? Us. They're broadcasting us. Now Facebook will go public next year, and uh, Ren, Ren will also go public, right? So what we're going to see from those companies is that they will license content to put into their us broadcasting. So the, it's going to be us plus all the stuff that used to be on cable. So you can expect next year Facebook will make music free, if not before that, because they have enough money to pay through advertising to pay for free music. It will make lots of movies free. You can already watch Batman on Facebook if you want to spend three Facebook credits. Right? So the biggest broadcasters of the world is us. And it's the social networks that we have built. Okay, that's a very big trend for media companies. Right? And of course, you had various attempts in the past, like MySpace and so on, to take on and bring an insight. Right? But when you kill the viral thing, you kill the company. Right? And this is a very difficult thing to do. So. Anyway, um, if you look at what's happening already, I can hardly read it myself, but in urban China, you can see a pretty amazing number. 97% uh, versus 81% are people who are watching video over the top, online video. This is a huge trend that goes on worldwide because now we have the ability to find things. Uh, if you're into interesting talks, you just go to TED.com. Right? If you like other stuff, you go to Fora TV or, or Blip.tv or you go to Gertube, that's my own channel. Uh, Gertube is a, is a joke, but, but you, get, you can get 200 hours of video on my channel. And guess what? I get 100,000 downloads. I don't know. Maybe my son is doing it. I don't know. But anyway, so you have this kind of phenomena happening pretty much across the world with the fragmentation of content. And, and here is the hard to see again is the... Uh, the China's social media landscape, I'm sure you're more familiar than I am with this, right? But social networks are broadcasters. If you think of this this way, just give it two years, right? If you're in the cable business, you got to think about this. If you're in the telecom business, all these guys are going to start broadcasting epic movie zones and mobile video and music and all that stuff. It's going to be a huge amount of explosion of, of, of uh, network load right? that you have to figure out how to monetize. So, very important in this context, I think, in general, is this, this is a global trend, not just the media, is that all of a sudden it goes from me to we. Walt Disney, Universal Studios, Universal Music, Warner Music, MTV, they were about me. I mean, me as being the central entity that decides, right? All of a sudden on the web, it's about this. Right? It's about we. Many to many. As Facebook is, and Google we get the best example for this, right? So we had this one guy over there in the past making the program. Now it's all these guys making the program. You have widgets on your television where you can see a Flickr channel on your television that's the same as the cable. So when Google TV comes along, they're doing this. They're going to eat 30% of the advertising budget of regular television because this is what people are looking for. So this whole idea of going from me to me to uh, to uh, to we and us. Uh, also means this, that selling units of content is going to be system failure. The music industry is the best example. I was there in 1998 in San Francisco when Napster first launched and reached 72 million users in, in 12 weeks. Okay, Not because it was free, that is a good driver, you know, free is a good driver. Yeah? Because it's about we. And that is the whole, I mean, we're sh literally sharing the bandwidth, right? So now, 13 years later, the music industry still hasn't figured out how to get away from selling copies. And that's what's killing them. So, if you're in the business of selling one song at a time, I'll do it because I don't care about a couple of dollars, but I won't spend $10,000 to fill up my iPod, right? That's what it would cost. So, who's going to do that? I mean, basically selling copies, as you can see right now, Netflix, you guys know Netflix? Unfortunately, you probably can't get it unless you're an expert at IP tunneling. Um, <laughs> Netflix in the U.S. has 22 million subscribers. 22 million for $10. Why does it work? Because they're not selling units. It's $10, you can watch one movie or 500 or whatever you want, and you have a social network attached to your Netflix page. You can see what other people watch. So it's no longer about selling units, it's about selling access. 
this is very good news for artists, composers, producers, publishers, right? Because when you sell copies, you have to make the copy. The, the, I know if you know this, but there's a 96.8% of all books are recycled. That means an author sits down for 2,000 hours, writes the book, somebody prints it, ships it all over the world, and they go in the garbage a few months later. That is the process of selling copies. So no wonder that artists don't make money, right, because the copy is so expensive. So this is going to really change in the future. We're going to move from copy to access. You know, New York Times, Kindle. So the whole new business model being uh, devised right now, how does this work? If you do this, really what we're buying here is we're not buying the words or the wisdom of the writer. We're buying paper. The New York Times was in the business of selling paper, not news. The news was the reason I had the paper, but really what made the money is the paper. That's where the ads were for $100,000 a page. The paper. When I do this, I'm all of a sudden in the business of selling ideas, concepts, words, writers, content, right? I'm not in the business of selling this. So in general, that's good news, but this is a huge paradigm shift. There's somebody here from the New York Times, but, but the, the number... Now a, I love the New York Times. I have to admit to that. I mean, I actually, I, I would be happy to pay, and I do pay. I have paid in the past already. <laughs> I mean, not to buy it, but to have digital. I was one of the 259,000 users of Time Select, you know, five years ago when they started. Uh, not very many people considering the power of the New York Times. But anyway, different topic. But the New York Times spends about 78% of the entire budget on the physical infrastructure. Not on the content. Now you have to think about this for a second, right? In the future, the Huffington Post, how much money do they spend on physical infrastructure? Very little. Uh, they're not paying their writers either, but that's a different story. <laughs> in any case, we're moving in this direction from copy to access. So if your business model is based on selling copies, you're in deep trouble. And if your business model is based on selling protective copies, you know, DRM copy, locked up stuff, whatever it is, you're in even more trouble. Because guess what? Everybody can have, we can't we can see it here, it goes from the copy economy to the access economy. The most successful companies in the last 10 years are those that have embraced the access economy. Skype, Twitter, YouTube, Google, eBay, Amazon, QQ, RenRen, uh, Orkut, and you name it, right? Social networks are about access, obviously. So that's the business model. We have to find out now how we do monetize the users in this network. Right? But that is going to be accomplished. I'll give you some examples in the next few slides. But the key question is the music industry, right? Where I worked for 10 years, uh, trying to help them to, uh, I wouldn't say see the light, but see, uh, see like a, a blimp of the light, a little blip on the screen. The decline is drastic, right? And the main paradigm of the music industry has been, ever since the internet was invented, this how to figure out to control what people are doing. Two weeks ago, or, or a month ago, Amazon announced that they're launching a, a locker in the cloud where you can upload your music and stream it, listen to it anywhere you are on your device because you own the music, right? Guess what the label said? It said, you can't do this because we can't control what people are doing. And this paradigm is killing them. The paradigm of control. So this is a very interesting because in the media business now we're moving from control to trust. Now think about this for a second. The most trusted media companies are not Sony Music. In fact, uh, the major record labels have been the number one hated entity in America for five years straight when you look at the rating right, because of this. But now they're saying, okay, clearly this is a global trend, not just in music. It's no longer about ownership but about access. This is the most popular way to buy a car, is not to buy a car, is to rent it. Car rental and car sharing, I wouldn't share my car, it's too old, but uh, car sharing is extremely powerful, it's exploding. Zipcar and other companies like this. Why do I need to own a car? I share it. So, uh, Spotify in Europe, why do I need to download the music and keep it? I just have access to 10 million songs. The same goes for bike sharing. Right? This is the biggest growth in transportation around the world is bike sharing and bike services. And guess what? It's almost free because they have a sponsor. So 
basically that's a trend that we're seeing around the world is from ownership to access. This is why copyright is sort of an academic discussion. If I can monetize the access, then let's just call it usage right. I mean, what difference does it make as long as revenues are being generated, it's all academic. Because people are no longer distinguishing between copy and access. A song that I stream, is that a copy? If I use a stream ripper, I can make a copy. Everybody knows what a stream ripper is. I mean, you guys know how to download a YouTube video, which is illegal. So is YouTube distributing those videos? Yes, but in theory, it's just streaming. So this whole discussion is moot. There is no difference between copying and access. This is just a legal, you know, it's for the lawyers. So now we can clearly see sharing is the default mindset of the digital society. Without sharing, we don't have to be connected because there's no point. Music has always been driven by sharing. Sitting around saying, hey, check out this cool song. Making tapes, forwarding things. When you kill the sharing, you kill, you kill the whole idea of what we're doing in media. So, the most viral things that we're seeing around the world all based on sharing. And look at Twitter, right? I mean, we're sharing all this meaningless babble, basically. And some of it is meaningful, becoming meaningful. So, very important, um, piracy. Great word in China. It's really quite simple. And, you know, Jeff Zucker, the president and CEO of Universal, no longer is, I don't think, uh, not because of this. Years ago, he said the best way to combat piracy is to make it available. That's probably why he got fired, you know. Because he saw the light, you know, that wasn't appreciated. But anyway, uh, consumer piracy is unmet demand. If we can't solve the fact that people love music or films, and we force them to pay a hundred times of what they're willing to buy, we don't have to wonder why they're getting it for free. So. We figure out, you can't see it down here, but this is the CEO of Macmillan saying, if we can't figure out to meet the price point and the kind of distribution that people want, it's our problem. Because it's not that people are not willing to pay. I mean, look at what people are paying. You guys know Farmville and right? Cityville? Farmville last year, $360 million right? in revenues for virtual tractors. $5.8 billion are spent on virtual products, you know, flowers. And then virtual flowers, you probably do those things all the time, like I do. And dating, uh, dating is content, $2 billion a year. LinkedIn, you guys know LinkedIn? $320 million a year, for what? That's content. People are spending money on content, so we have to figure out how to make it available in a way that everybody will buy. And that is, I think, that's the future. So. In Europe, and of course around the world, we're debating laws that basically says if you don't follow the rules of XYZ Corporation somewhere, um, then we will disconnect you and throw you off the internet. Right? That, that's the punishment. Right? So it's really quite simple. I mean, especially in China, right? When you enforce control, when you should have trust and appreciation and engagement, you will die. Because what happens is that everybody finds a way around this one way or the other. So it's basically like you throw a stick in the river, it's not going to stop the river from flowing. If you throw a tree in the river, it'll slow it down for a while. You can build a wall, but you can't stop the river. Right? So you have to figure out how to put a boat on the river. And that's what we're seeing on a worldwide level, is to figure out how to actually get this into place. Okay? This is my iPad. Uh, not the iPad, just the piece of it. Right? Uh, I went on a trip with my wife, I downloaded 30 movies for her, because it was her birthday. And I figured, okay, if she gets bored with me, she can watch the movies. Um, what happened, we're getting on the plane, I pull out the iPad, and say, okay, here, watch uh, Till Schweiger's uh, newest movie, right? Turns out, 30 days, all expired. Right? All expired after 30 days. Right? So I'm the guy who bought a movie for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, a piece, who gets nothing after 30 days. So copy protection stops the buyer, right? not the pirates, not the, not the really evil. Right? It stops the buyer. So that is a process clearly that we're seeing around the world, and and so we have this world now, right? All the cool stuff is forbidden. Right? All the stuff that we really want actually is not supposed to happen because it doesn't fit the business plan. We're living in a world to where the pre-internet rules won't work. 
we have to adapt them. And the really good companies like Google and others said they disrupt this model. You can wait another three to six months and Google will make music free and paid for the composers. Free to us, paid for them. It's not rocket science, it's something that I'm working on with other companies, but um, that's clearly the model that we're going to see. So, um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because we want to get to the discussion, right? That's, all mesmerized. that's good. Okay, the scene from my book uh, called Music 2.0, which you can download for free on the internet. Okay. We're going from this idea of the network, you know, the central entity, the network, to the networked. So if you're in the media business and you're a network, you've got to get networked, which means you have to get down to where other people can actually do something with you. You have to uh, create open rules, and we're going from this idea of copyright to the idea of usage right, which essentially is an extension. So just think back 100 years ago, if you can, 80 years ago, there was this invention called radio. When radio was invented, every single producer of music said, this is the devil's work. Right? Because the radio makes music available for free. So they said, we'll never allow radio, because when people listen to radio, they don't go to the concert. They don't buy a piano. They become stupid and just listen to radio and don't pay. But have you heard this before? Now we have the internet where everybody's saying, you know, it's free, that's not good. But radio turned out to be the biggest driver of the music business ever. Ever. Because once people hear you on the radio, they get addicted and they want more. That's how we got to the CD business. So the same thing is going to happen on the internet. We need to figure out a way to incorporate this in the plans of how we monetize this. So, um, the celestial jukebox, right? the virtual jukebox that we talked about with Napster, which basically means all the content in the sky, that's here now. Right? We have this here now. It's, it's actually partly legal even, including Spotify and Mog and, and uh, GrooveShark and many other servers and music, and Netflix. Right? Why don't you guys have Netflix here? Answer the question. I can answer the question for you. It's because you never bought DVDs. That's your punishment for not having bought DVDs. You won't get Netflix. Why, why is it possible for Google to make a deal with the record labels in China to perform music on the browser? Right? Just type in any name. If you use top100.cn, top100.cn, you can play music for free on the browser. Why is that possible? Because Google is sharing the revenues from advertising with the labels. Why don't we have this in Europe? Because we keep buying CDs. I mean, the logic is flawless here. Anyway, what's happening across the board is that all content will move into the cloud. Movies, films, television, books, education, money is content also. Moves, money is content, but moves into the cloud. Medical records, all that stuff moves into the cloud and becomes completely fluent. And if you want to be in this business, this is like a trillion dollar business. Right? The telecom business is a 2.1 trillion dollar business. And the content that goes in the cloud is a, a big slice of that in the future. So, uh, the direction that we're heading here, it's like, this is a great example. Amazon, one of my favorite examples, right? They are really a disruptor. They came up with the Kindle and said, nobody has asked us for this, but we think it's, we should have this, right? They made a market. They made a market. So now they're saying, Amazon's saying, or a few months ago, I said, okay, how about if you find your Facebook friends and integrate them into Amazon and see what they have purchased and share your purchases called social commerce. So now you have this interface to where all your friends can see what you have purchased and so on. This has increased the sales of Amazon by over 10%. And it's an API, right? It's an afternoon job for an engineer. <laughs> yeah, all right, bottom line, yeah. It's simple, okay? So it's about enabling, not about preventing. It's also not about protection, it's about engagement. If you want to be in the media business, you have to engage, otherwise you're finished because you cannot possibly even try to protect. I mean, we're, we've seen this, it's, it doesn't actually work. So uh, I'll give you a final trend here where we're entering the period, and you're extremely lucky to be part of this, uh, of what I call telemedia. It's a complete convergence of telecom, telecommunications and media. All of the telecoms, Singtel and all the other 
the telecoms in the so-called developing countries, they are all moving into the media business. You will see bundled offerings where your mobile phone, if you buy a contract from MTN in Africa or from Telecom Cell in Indonesia or wherever, your music and other content will be bundled into the subscription. When you have DSL, you have content included just like you have now with cable TV. So I call this uh, telemedia. There's been research shown, for example, that uh, if an ISP, an internet service provider, bundles music, they can reduce the churn rate, you know, people leaving the service by 15%, some people say 50%. You know how many millions that is? Hundreds of millions for companies like this. So that's a trend that we're seeing pretty much on a global level. Another screenshot from Amazon. Um, I have a US account, but I can't use it because it's, it's walled off here, right? But a few weeks ago, Amazon sent an email saying, you know what, we're going to start doing movie distribution, and because you're a nice guy, there's 5,000 movies for free streaming on Amazon.com. Just go log in, pick any here, see, zero. Price point, zero. Amazon gave 5,000 free movies for free streaming to all of the customers who have a premium account, which means free shipping. No, 70 bucks a year or something. But you spend the shipping anyway. So this is what I call smart, a smart move and also an extremely viable move because now we're all saying, this is pretty interesting, what if I can give you $50 and get more movies? So it's about engagement, about disruption, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, rather convoluted slide, which I will probably recover uh, quickly because of that. So the future is what we call interdependence, which means that if you're a record label or a content owner, you cannot make money without the other guys. We're out of the period of Disney uh, and Universal Studios where you can control the, the ecosystem. It's almost impossible now. Now we're in a system to where you're going to say, okay, I need to get some advertisers, I need device makers, I need the social networks, which are broadcasters, and I need telcos and operators. Right? This is the idea of saying, creating a new ecosystem. And this will be created not in a developed country. So you're right at the, at the point to where you can contribute to this right here. I'll skip this. Um, this is also not new, but I think that um, you'll understand what this means based on the idea of bundling and upselling. The most successful media business in the last decade has been games. And why have games been so great? Because they give us stuff for free, we get hooked, we buy more. <laughs> Simple thing, right? You download a game from the internet, Farmville is free, right? You play the game, you say, oh, I, want, I need to have a bigger carrot. Right. One dollar. Right. World of Warcraft, I need a bigger shield. You know, or whatever it is. Right. Billions of dollars being made with the same principle which is called freemium. Starting free and upselling. If you can figure this out for your newspaper, or for your film company, or for television, that's the key. If you reverse this and you say it's ten bucks to look at me, you'll have two people doing it. So that's, again, that's a good example from the music business. Except for Netflix, for example, which allows you for 30 days to watch movies for free. Same idea. I get hooked, and I see the light, so to speak, and say, okay, 10 bucks, sounds like a good deal. So that is the way that content is moving forward. And you can expect, as I was saying earlier, all content is moving into the cloud. And when I say all content, I mean education, which is a trillion dollar business in itself. All the stuff that we currently do that has paper involved. Right? This is very good for everyone involved except for distributors of stuff. I mean, if you make cars, maybe you're not so happy about car sharing. Right? Or maybe they are. But Audi in Germany has now spent one tenth of the entire R&D budget in cars that don't have a driver. Right? In cars that drive themselves. Why would anybody in their right mind buy a car where you don't drive? Well, the future clearly is that people are going to be in cars that drive themselves. That's a fact. So even if it sounds like an antidote to the current business, that is the future. So moving into the cloud, that's clearly going to happen. You know, if you see Amazon, Safari books, and so on, and of course Spotify and others, which leads me to a very important point, also a very sticky point. Not from me. This is from a guy from... Uh, I forgot his name in 2006 from the American Advertising Association, who said data is the new oil in 2006. Okay. What does this mean? Well, we're always connecting, doing stuff 
on the network now. We're saying where we are, we're giving things a like, we're forwarding emails, we're tagging things, we're commenting, right? So we're creating, every day the amount of data is increasing. Right? Today in one month we generate more data than the entire 10 years of the internet five years ago. So it's just exploding. So all this data is worth gold because when you have this data, you can talk to us in a more meaningful way. You can advertise to it to us, which is a $560 billion budget. You can use that data to do all kinds of things. So that's, that's what's going to drive also the content business in the future, because data is the new oil. Uh, which brings me to this very important point. Uh, this is a mock-up of a Facebook page and the Facebook options here. We're living now in a world where it's essentially a default of what I call publicity. Uh, I've taken this from Jeff Jarvis. Uh, it's no longer privacy, it's publicity, right? So if you do anything, if you're an artist, if you're a businessman, whoever you are, if you do stuff, you're by default public. Because the publicity involves that people find out about you, which is what you want when you do anything, unless you're a hermit. So now we have the standard of saying that basically all of us in this room are by default public. I mean, we make photos, we Twitter, you're here, you know, in London you get photographed 450 times a day on average, when you, when you just walk around in London, right? So our default has moved from private to public. Now, this is a really serious thing because we may not actually like this idea very much. So we may have to do something to become private again. So. On the subject of privacy, I would just say one thing, and this is very important for media, is that we now have to actually do the reverse. We have to become private, or make it private, because we are by default public, right? It's a reverse. Depends on what you like. So, uh, I think this is a very important point as far as the future of data is concerned. I think we're also going to start selling our data. Uh, do we have any Gmail users here, right? The Gmail users? You guys? Yeah, of course, everyone uses Gmail, pretty much, right? What is Gmail doing? It's reading your email. <laughs> Gmail reads your email and says, I'm going to Hong Kong. I do some music stuff. It says, okay, and pretty soon I have this pitch for a concert where Gmail knows that I'm going to be interested. And they make a boatload of money that way. They read my email. Right? So I've made a deal with the devil, and not Google, I mean. Uh, to, uh, sorry, I don't mean to equate the two here, yeah, actually. But I've made a deal that says, I'm giving you access to my private stuff so you can give me free email. That's the deal. I'm giving you data, and that's going to be very extreme in the future. We're going to start saying, you know what, if I log into Facebook in this mall, I'm going to expect some free movies. Because Facebook will turn around and send me a coupon from The Gap to where Facebook makes $5 if I buy a pair of jeans. So we're going to start bartering our data information this will, it will be a key driver of the content economy because that data is worth trillions of dollars. So this answers the question of how content gets paid in the future. It will be data that pays for it. Data that drives advertising and marketing. Okay, I'm really going to get to the end now. Uh, we already talked about Netflix. Okay, on the topic of free, I get this question literally every two seconds. Uh, people saying, you know, if it's free, how do I make money? Well, the, it's really quite simple. You make it free if it has to be free. If you can take money, you take money. But you have to figure out where to put the toll booth. I don't know if you have toll booth uh, at bridges. You do have that here, right? Uh, but let's say you're at the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. The bridge costs now $6. If the bridge would cost $500, everybody would say, you know what, we're going to build a ferry. We're going to kill the people at the toll booth. We're going to be very upset, right? But six dollars, you're going to say, well, I don't drive across the bridge a hundred times a day, so it's okay. You know, it's not, not cheap, but it's reasonable. So in the media business, entertainment, we have to figure out where the toll booth goes. We don't have to kill the toll booth, right? but if you put the toll booth in the wrong place, everybody gets around and gets very angry. So iTunes, for example, is a toll booth that most people don't accept. I do because I don't care about the dollar or two, right? but by and large, it's not a fitting toll booth. So this is a very important part, the art of toll booth placement is going to be crucial for the future. This is the things they want. Uh, so this question I get literally every half a second, how do you compete with free? Well, the answer is 
You don't compete because you don't sell copies, you sell experiences, right? You sell access. And so in this way, when you compete with free, you have to be better. You have to be likable. Already that's a big point, right? Most media companies aren't that likable. So we're not that hot on giving them money. Uh, better service, better interface, socially connected, fair pricing, and so on, right? All of this creates a bundle of where we feel like we want to pay. Now think about this for a second. What was the last time you felt like you wanted to pay, like you're dying to pay? Right? The premium example where we're dying to pay is Apple. Why do we do that? I mean, it's, it's obviously very expensive, completely closed. The guy's a tyrant, a, a benevolent <laughs> dictator. Right? Okay. We're still happy to pay because we find it attractive. Right? The service is fluid. We think the ratio is okay. It's quite likable in terms of design, not because of the company. It, it's all the stuff in the combination that works for us, right? And they can put a very high toll booth, and we're willing to pay. So the way that you compete for free is not by saying you can't have it for free. It's by saying, I have a better service that's going to beat what you get for free. If you share music or films or television shows,